The reason we're talking about what has been sub called survivorship, and I'm going to sort of suggest we call it something different, um, and doing this last is because I think there's there's a lot of new. Uh, it, it, we're moving into a new era, really, of, of patient care, and the sort of the story of cancer is is changing, and we thought that, that might be quite a good way to end because it's a, on an optimistic note in in most situations and we've invited uh, and I'll introduce them as we go along uh, some colleagues who are actually working alongside us and with us and for the patients in providing services for patients who've had cancer and doing some amazing things. The patients really have led this. This, is, this has not been something that the healthcare profession have suddenly thought, oh, we've got to really do something here. Well, what patients have said is that it's fairly miserable living after cancer. Um, and actually what they have done is, is, is actually the word abandoned comes up uh, hugely. The sort of what is success for the healthcare profession is not success for patients. And, and we've never married those up. So now making it more patient-centered, we have begun to think about what is important to the patients. And actually how we can actually provide for that and there's a huge number of areas that uh, may be affected once a patient has had a cancer diagnosis and been uh, th been been through treatment and what I would like to think is that GPs are in a position to be able to offer support and understanding about patients in this situation and be proactive about it and actually one of the key things about the GP role is it's actually less work for you we know that a patient who've had who has had cancer is twice as likely to see a GP a year compared to somebody who hasn't had cancer and actually a lot of that is because they just don't know what to do and they don't know how to use the system and what is helping them what can help them what can they do so they attend and often it's not very clear why they attend things just aren't right and I think that that, that is something that's really satisfying as a GP to be able to sort of uh, identify so just what's actually happening I as when I started as Macmillan GP some time ago you know the story was that two million people in the UK had a cancer diagnosis uh, and were alive at any one time. You know, that uh, in 2015, the figure has now gone up to 2.5 million, and we're looking at by 2030, 4 million people in the UK living with or after a cancer diagnosis. So, this is not a problem that's going to go away, and it's one that if we're going to make the most appropriate use of our healthcare services and people are going to live well, that we need to, you know, grasp and, uh, and, and be able to have an input into. Um, I think that what's different is that, that having cancer is not just about having you know, a diagnosis, treatment, and then you wait until you die. Uh, there are now phases which are sort of recognised, and I hope to identify these for you so you can see how they impact on the cancers that we're managing. So there is this diagnosis and treatment phase, then there is that sort of period of time afterwards where often it's, it's, it's that recovery, we talk about re rehabilitative palliative care, but then there are those phases of early monitoring, later monitoring, and then in a number of patients progressive disease and then the end of life uh, period of, of, of time. Um, and that, that, that's a sort of a descriptive um, a, a, a descriptive diagram and it is, it, it'll be different for different diseases and actually with the improvements that there are in cancer care and with the increasing incidence prevalence of cancers we're actually going to see that's, that's accounting for the increase from 2005, uh, two and a half million to four million that there are going to be more people being diagnosed and treated Inevitably, that shifts into that rehabilitative phase, but there are going to be many more people, actually, who we're going to be monitoring after. And actually, the hospital services aren't going to be able to cope with that. And what is actually fundamentally more important is that it doesn't provide for what the patients need at that time. They don't need hospital follow-up unless it is in certain situations uh, and, and for very specific and key reasons. But most patients don't need the follow-up that we need now. But what they do need is the knowledge of how to react, how to be, uh, how to re-engage, you know, at the drop of a, uh, of a hat. Surviving cancer doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to live well. Uh, we're also thinking not only about the disease, but actually the consequences of cancer. And you'll see here that, that, that there are 
at any one point in time, there are three out of every four patients who's got a cancer diagnosis are in this post-treatment phase uh, and, that, and that in that phase a lot of them are dealing with the consequences of the treatment um, and actually what Macmillan established was that they've got a lot of unmet needs and actually and, and I'm sure that the, the others contributing this evening will have a, a view on their experience of seeing patients and actually helping with body image, helping them get back to work, helping them with physical activity um, and, and the knowledge of what they can and can't do. So uh, a huge opportunity for us to in improve what can be done for uh, for patients? The consequences are just are also not just physical, and of course that's what the medical model follows up in hospital. Um, it doesn't think about some of the practical psych uh, psychosocial and emotional consequences of the disease, and that needs to be taken into account. Life is not going to be normal afterwards, and. and that it's about adapting to a new normal. Because how often have you heard a patient say, oh, I'll never be normal again? Well, we all at different times of our life, don't you? You never normal after you have kids. You never normal after, you know, lots of things. So um, bear in mind that, that, that their expectations, you may need to negotiate what those should be um, and be optimistic about them. And it's all around actually supporting patients to self-manage. Now, that's not abandoning them in a different way. This is about how can we give them the skills to, you know, look after themselves. Some patients will not be able to do it. And risk stratification is another sort of phrase that's used. And, and, and where there are some patients who get on and do it anyway, that, that, that they just sort of, they know what they want to do. They know what's right. They know how they live their lives and they get on and they do it. Then there are those who may have very non-complex disease, but psychologically are very dependent on a, uh, a specialist nurse at the hospital and this sort of this this dependence on the, the, the hospital system for their needs is a habit that that we don't think really improves their care other than where it's really necessary and what the risk stratification does is look at that person and identify why they may be different and why in fact they may need a closer relationship and ongoing with the specialist nurse and or the consultant who's provided their care for a period of time um, because the more complex their needs are, the greater the input from uh, the sort of multidisciplinary team will be needed. First of all, LILAC stands for Live Your Life After Cancer. Um, and it's, it, it, we, we see pe men and women, any age, any cancer. Um, initially, um, we, we weren't, we, initially we were thinking breast cancer and we gradually realised, like, like Simon was saying, you know, even if you eat two people have exactly the same cancer, their, everything is going to be different, their experience is going to be different, their, what happens to them is going to be different. So this is just um, some results, from, I mean, mainly what's, what's, what it's showing, and it, obviously it's, it was just a feasibility study, but there seemed to be quite dramatic improvement in people's negative feelings. Um, and that social deprivation index, I didn't know what that was, but it's actually to do with how isolated people felt before they did the programme compared to afterwards, which I think I would put down to confidence. Um, very often people come along and they think they're doing a lot less well than everybody else. And um, what's lovely about being in a group is people see very quickly that actually everybody feels the same. Um, and though they're having a different time, they all feel similarly. Um, so overall, some of the conclusions they came to was that there was a demand for this sort of a service and that um, it showed promise with regard to helping people regain confidence. At the so, beginning of treatment, most people feel, at the beginning of when they're diagnosed, most people, strangely, with most cancers, feel okay. Obviously, that's, that's a generalisation, and I should say at the beginning, everybody is different. Uh, and, and I, yeah, I can't say that enough. But this is a graph put together with uh, thousands and thousands of people over years. So um, we do find it useful. So generally, through that treatment phase, physical well-being goes downwards. Um, again, mental and emotional well-being can vary enormously. Some people find they're incredibly emotional. Other people find, you know, it's, we often say it's a bit like being a warrior. You've just got your armour on and you're just facing, you know, the next challenge, which is probably why, like I said, I didn't really think very much about the end of treatment. Um, life is completely disrupted by all the things, the appointments, uh, uh, coping with the symptoms and all the rest of it. And it's, you might call it survival mode. After um, treatment finishes, um, the, in Holland, obviously, they, they were aware and they were showing this, but 
generally in the UK at the time, people weren't aware, you know, that there it's, and it's obvious when we think about it, there is going to be an emotional, a psychological dip. Um, and the extent of that, I think, is often quite shocking for people. Um, and of course, they don't know where to go with their concerns. Um, and generally, because the place they've been going through the first phase is the hospital or their GPs, they, and because they have plenty of physical symptoms, whatever treatment they've had, there will be physical symptoms, they tend to present to you as GPs or to hospital staff. And it's a time when um, often friends and relatives and neighbours uh, maybe take a step back and think, you know, you're okay now. Um, but generally, uh, people do feel all these things, yeah, disorientated, confused, bewildered, overwhelmed. Um, and I know, I know I did. I see lilac uh, as being useful for everybody, but actually, <coughs> perhaps particularly for those patients who suffer with really bad anxiety or depression and find get, coming to terms with that uncertainty f and fear of recurrence really difficult, this can be really helpful because as soon as you adopt a coaching approach which is about taking action um, with support, um, you, you start to gain confidence and people do feel quite different quite quickly. We look at the whole picture, first of all, what has happened, not just your health and what's happened, but all of the different areas of your life. There's time to connect and share with other people and to actually learn from the experience because generally there's so much going on in people's life and they feel so much under pressure to get back to a lot of normal things, to try and be whatever they were before to everybody, that actually taking this time is difficult. Um, acknowledging emotions in the West, we're, we're so bad at um, actually accepting that emotions are completely normal uh, part of life and that they can really help us to know what we need to do. Um, becoming aware of our own attitudes and beliefs, this is a big part of what we do looking at personal values and belief system and how you can actually use your values and challenge your belief system. Um, looking at saboteur, gremlin, think our internal critical voice and how that's stopping us um, doing things that we need to do and some goal setting and action planning. So holistically, just, just um, you know, health and well-being uh, is just one part of the whole jigsaw and all these areas um, can be really drastically affected. Um, but what's, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why people don't actually know what to do because there's so many different things that they could um, tackle. So one of the things we generally say is, you know, just start anywhere. You know, rather than waiting until you think you've come up with which is the most important area, just pick something and start to make, take little steps towards changing it. Um, and people find their confidence grows and once they've done it in a few areas and they understand a little bit more about their own personal values and what helps them, um, then they're, they, they're really, they're, they get going. Um, so outcomes are people feel more in control, more positive about the future, m much more able to self-manage and much more resilient. Um, they feel more balanced, increased confidence, and they, f they take away some practical tools and skills that they can use. I mean, everything that we do in the workshop, they can revisit um, through, you know, whenever they want to. Um, so to summarize, it's holistic, it's inclusive. We try and be inspiring and we very much want to empower people because there's so much uh, information for people out there, but it's about deciding what's right for them. Um, and if it's it's like the exercise thing, if I choose to, if I say oh, I'm going to go to the gym, it's not going to work for me because I'm somebody who loves being out in nature, and I like peaceful settings. So you know, but so many people don't. They just try one thing and it doesn't work, and then they think, oh, exercise just isn't for me. Obviously, Joe's going to talk all about um, the exercise side of things, but. Um, so I think it's a, it's, this is a very practical and simple thing and what we'd like to be doing is running day workshops that are all over the place so that anybody who's had or is living with cancer can come to a workshop whenever suits them, um, when they're ready. 
Um, and I think some people are ready straight away, some people would like to come later on, and a lot of people might find their way through it without. Um, it definitely uh, seems to be very effective, and we, we're starting to do some longer-term follow-up now, but when we meet people who came to groups three or four years ago, they're, they're, say, they're telling us about how effective and how much they're using the things that they learnt on that day. So we have tried to prepare patients or give them the tools so that they feel they can self-manage. I think we'd all agree you know, that, that finances are so tight now in the NHS. Um, we, we're doing really well in terms of our patient survivorship, in terms of how long patients are living with cancer and beyond. But as, as, a, as we've mentioned, you know, patients now, that the number of patients who are affected by cancer is growing and growing and growing. And as a health service, we can't afford to maintain the support that we do in, in, in secondary care throughout that journey and we wouldn't want to because actually this is about patients living their lives and people who are affected by cancer, some may be living with it and some may be cured from cancer but they're still living with the fact they've had it and I think most patients will say that life will never be the same and it's about finding a new normal and very often it's about how, uh, how to learn to live with the fact they've had cancer and the anxiety associated with recurrence and new normal um, and all sorts of things that it poses. I think that one of the things about cancer care and, and healthcare in general is that there is often no motivation to change, that we keep on doing what we're doing without questioning it. And I think we've seen that with the increasing number of patients who have a cancer diagnosis and an increasing a benefit of the treatment that patients are having and so living longer that we need to think differently about the services for these patients and for their families and for their employers and I think that living well after cancer is not now a concept that we really need to develop and there are ways that are developing that that can help these patients often within the NHS but actually a huge number of organisations and individual inspirational people outside the NHS and what we can do is say to patients that your life is not defined by your cancer that become the person that you are and live in a way that you now can and uh, enhance what time you have in some patients it may be short in others it may be a cure and it's understanding what the implications are of the, the disease you've had and what may be next and helping you to manage that yourself comfortably with skills and feeling that if there is a need for health services to review a problem that you think is happening that that's done very easily very quickly most often to reassure you because most people are worried about recurrence won't have recurrence but it's much better to find out about it sooner. So we need to change the way patients are looked after and there are a huge number of ways that that can now develop with huge benefits uh, around, their, uh, the, the, around the way they self-manage and are, are educated about living well through exercise and uh, through taking opportunities of life coaching, those sorts of things. So cancer is behaving differently and I think we need to adjust and we need to get the health care providers to recognise that and signpost patients and their families onto those services that we know understand this and are showing tremendous ways of enhancing patients' quality of life and ability to live well. Well I think what's most important for people who have had cancer is to recognise that it's absolutely normal to feel confused, disorientated, bewildered and to and to not really be able to know how you're going to go forward in your life. Um, and um, I, I just think once people recognise that actually everybody is feeling like that, then they start to they heave a sigh of relief and they start they can begin to look at what is important to them now. And I feel that well that's very much why we set up Live Your Life After Cancer, recognising that everybody's different. And so what's going to work for one person afterwards isn't going to work for another person. You know, some of us will be quite happy to go back to the job we were doing before, and for other people, actually that would be totally wrong. Then there are other, other people who would like to go back but actually their side effects or problems that they have afterwards mean they just can't. And so it's just really a way of helping people to, to take, 
take some time to look at what's happened, how it's affected them and what's going to be right for them and to start to feel that they can start exploring so that they can go forward and live a good life afterwards. <laughs>